Fuzzy dice, check. Wacker con bobblehead doll, check. Diesel incense, uh, check. Cool. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another fantastic Tuesday here on the Exploding Days channel. My name is Askren, and I will be your host tonight. And I am joined in in spirit, if not in body, by uh, my friend who is on... No, I flipped my camera. He's on this side of me, uh, though he's not actually because I don't have his camera here. Uh, Wolfgang Bauer. How's it going, my friend? I am I'm doing really well. Let me oh I uh I forgot to unmute that mic. What oh. oh hold on. No. We're all good. Where's my uh where's my chat widget? There's my chat widget. Okay. Um so let's turn Optimus Rhyme down. So how uh I guess do you wanna uh, do you wanna start off by telling people a little bit about yourself, who you are and where you come from and uh Sure. Why so, why it's it's really cool to have you here. <laughs> um it's cool to be here, but I'm I'm a long time RPG fiend. Um and my background is hey, I used to edit Dungeon Magazine and Dragon Magazine. I used to freelance for those guys. I remember the days when you would type out your manuscript and send it in. So I'm I'm one of these old as the hills gamers. Um, later on, went to work at uh, Wizards of the Coast. I worked on Dark Matter there. That was my publication with uh, with Money Cook. Um, written a ton of stuff for D and D over the years. Uh, a lot for for Paizo, some of their adventure paths, and then eleven years ago now, just about exactly. Uh, the company anniversary is this week. Uh, 11 years ago this week, I found a Cobalt Press, and I said, let's do my own stuff. And I basically did crowdfunding before there was Kickstarter. <laughs> and it was a pain in the neck, let me tell you. It was like, ah, how do did, I get people to give me money? How do I track them? Where's my database? Did you have to Where use my email? Yeah. Oh, my God. There was email. <laughs> Uh, it was horrible. It was like, PayPal me directly. Here's a tip jar. I think I made like <laughs> 80 bucks on my first project and, and I was hooked, right? I'm like, oh, look, I've cut out all those annoying middlemen, like, you know, people who know what to do about layout or <laughs> art or <laughs> editing. <laughs> and later I decided maybe I want all those annoying middlemen because they actually know what they're doing about art and <laughs> layout. Um... But yeah, I basically built built this small press third party company from the ground up, uh, and over the last eleven years, it's been a blast. I mean, we've made every mistake there is to make. We've we've managed to ship things on time. We just finished our tenth Kickstarter uh, last month, and and we somehow continue to put out stuff that people want. I mean, we've done official collaborations and partnerships with. Uh, with Wizards of the Coast uh, in 5th edition and and with Paizo for Pathfinder a while ago. So, I don't know. I think part of what I do is I just stick around like like the kobolds the press is named for. It's hard to get rid of me. <laughs> um, it's like, uh, sheer numbers and dogged persistence will take you far. So that's that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's um, that's kind of been my, uh, been my motto is... It doesn't matter if you're good or not. You just kind of just keep bothering people until until they let you yeah. do, some, do what you want to do. I mean, at some point it helps if you're good or if you practice <laughs> well. until you're good. But <laughs> but step one is be willing to get out there and bother people. And that's that's kind of the philosophy I've gone with for a long time. Because, I mean, starting with the slush piles and the magazines and the Stone Age, it's like, well, who are these people? And what do they want to write? And are they any good? And let's give them a chance. I was that junior assistant editor who was always going up to the big bosses, like mm -hmm. Kim Mohan or Roger Moore, and say, this person's really good. You should publish them. <laughs> and I would be told, no, no, we don't do that. Or the magazine's full, kid. You bother me, right? Um, and now and I'm in the opposite position of, well, I've got this book, and I want to have some writers and artists, and yeah, I the phrase go away kid you bother me hasn't crossed my lips yet but it's it's just a matter of time so awesome. i love seeing the new new freelancers is is a big part of the fun here i mean that's why i do cobalt guides right how to's mm -hmm. for game design and game mastering um done I, like six of them 
I think that that's actually an interesting segue because we were talking about a little bit a little bit about this before we dived into the show. Um, uh, and I do want to get uh, actually, you know what? Before let me let me put a pin in that topic because before we dive okay. in, I forgot to do uh, announcements at the beginning of the show. I don't have many, so uh, bear with me here. We've just got a few real quick announcements, and those are obviously if you haven't already, you can check out our the giveaway that we have going on for April. It's just exclamation point giveaway in the chat. Uh, and Daisulu will happily tell you that we are currently giving away a brand new D&D 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide, as well as uh, a brand new copy of The Curse of Strahd Adventure Path. That is, uh, nice. And I've also actually recently thrown in a DM screen on top of that, and you get some mm-hmm. dice in there. It's everything you need to start DMing right out of the box. That's what are, that's what we're... Uh, we're helping to uh, to hook you guys up with. So if you haven't entered, all you got to do is hit that Bitly link, and you, if you're already following the channel you or uh, on Twitter, you already got entries. So go claim them. Uh, the other thing is that we do have. Uh, last month we had a donation goal for our for a big party stream that will probably be at the end of March. I haven't decided ex- on the exact date, but I will be gathering a bunch of friends and we'll be drinking and playing games and uh, the. There'll be all kinds of stuff. So party stream is coming a little bit later. Uh, And also, obviously, April is bringing us International Tabletop Day. I can't get into the exact specifics, but all of the uh, pretty much all the channels on the TGN network, which is our streaming team, uh, the really cool people that we stream with are going to be trying to put together some kind of really cool collaboration for Tabletop Day. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. We There, there may be other big-name streams getting involved, too. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I will have more to talk about in a little while. And also, uh, there is an unnamed secret project that's coming to the channel. But uh, keep your eyes on Twitter for that. Uh, so that's that's the announcements. I wanted to uh, y- because you were talking about the uh, you know new new freelancers and kind of the co yeah. how to guides. Uh, we talked a little bit before the stream about the uh, the fifth edition DMs Guild uh, and I guess other the you know the other sites like it the uh, um, RPG drive throughs and th- you know sure. that all share the same code. Uh, do you like? I guess you're a pretty big proponent of people getting involved in those systems. Yeah, I mean, at some level, it, the hobby is always like the moment you decide I'm I'm not just a player. I'm going to be a, a DM. I'm going to be a game master. Is sort of the moment you you step out of the role of this is an entertainment. This is my hobby. I'm having a great time. Into I'm creating something and I'm going to share it with mm-hmm. some of my friends, right? And then it's a, a a rosy path from well, I've made a campaign and my friends seem to like it to hey, the best adventure in that was this, and I'll just share that out here with, you know, people on Twitter, or I'll put it up on a Google Drive, or, you know, maybe I'll clean it up and have my friend make some cover art and we'll draw a better map, and I'll put it on the DMs Guild. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a slight level up from there to say, you know, maybe I'll pay an editor and I'll I'll clean it up some more and I'll add that extra set of encounters and take some playtest feedback and I'll put it on drive-thru or... You know, maybe I'll print a few copies and pass them out, run it at a convention. Uh, it, it's really easy to get into tabletop RPG as a creator these days mm-hmm. where, I mean, I can, I can tell horror stories about what it used to take <laughs> to publish a book in print, much less PDF, right? Um when I started at TSR, there were still paste-up machines and typesetting machines, and there was a smell uh, in the room where they were pasting down pages for layout, right? There was no digital nothing. So now it's like, it's cool, it's awesome, you can do it. All those dark days are gone. Anyone can dive into the pool. And, I don't know, I, we've done crowdfunding and patron-oriented projects and sort of, you know, open-door design projects Forever, like the Tome of Beasts, I said, every backer of this Kickstarter can submit a monster, and we're going to print the 20 best, and that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. So there's all these ways to get involved if you want to. If you just want to play or you just want to buy the cool new thing, great. But I don't know. For me, a large part of the fun of the hobby is making new stuff and saying, hey, look what I did. Um, 
and everybody can do as much or as little of that as they want to. And the Cobalt Guides are kind of one way to encourage people to do that. Uh, Cobalt Press has an open door submission policy, so anybody can send us a pitch. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just have all these open channels to say, give it your best shot, try it. And, you know, we don't promise we're going to print it all. <laughs> we had 2,300 backers for Toma Beasts, and I think like 200 and something of them sent us one monster, right? And so we had 250 monsters to choose from to get the best 20. Um, yeah, that worked. That that worked fine. But there were also, you, of course, two, 230 people who were disappointed. Do you have uh, uh, Do you have plans to to sort of reuse those uh, those old monsters that didn't make the cut? Nope, no, no, no. Uh, uh, we just wanted to take the the top run. There were some good stuff in the other section, but some of them were like. Okay, you know, English is your second language, or, yeah, yeah, man, yeah. you have not playtested this thing at all, even though it sounds super cool. Um, there were others that, like, well, you know, if we wanted to write that monster ourselves, we would. Um, so it was a variety of things. And, and in other cases, it was just like, yeah, we've already got one, or it just didn't, didn't float your boat. So, um, so with contests like that, we generally just... There was a time when we would turn all the leftovers into what we called the Monday Monsters on uh, CobaltPress.com. Yeah. And we just th throw up a monster every week. But eh, we're sort of at the point now where uh, it doesn't feel like we're adding anything to that. Like somebody could take that, could take their text and put it on Tumblr or Facebook or PDF it up and throw it on DMs Guild, and it's like, you don't need our help with that. We mm -hmm. we want to promote the top 10% and say, all right, you guys, you know, you did one of the top 20 monsters. Hey, you want to do a freelance project that's a little bigger? Right? They, they turn into the farm team and the next generation of writers. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, the B&B &B Tavern for following. Welcome to the madness, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Um... So the uh, I guess we we were talking about now. Here, here's the thing that I uh, that I by the way I I have the Tomo Beasts. I really uh, I haven't gotten a chance to use much of it, but I I really enjoy it. The reason I haven't gotten a chance to use much of it is because uh, while I do have that, I also have every Pathfinder Bestiary, and I uh. I'm one of those guys who I don't I don't tend to convert things mechanically. I just kind of use them. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, no one will ever know, but it's it's a very it's a very common tactic for me to when I need a monster, I will like literally just use the Pathfinder stat block in Fifth Edition, and no one ever knows the difference. Uh, mm, good thing you don't tell them about it. Yeah, well, I, there's there's a simple there's some simple math. If you subtract like five from every number, so like you get to a reasonable thing. So it's like the, if the attack bonus is like way way too high, you can just okay, this seems, plus 15 seems a little bit high. <laughs> Let me just scale that down a little bit. But other than that, like, it, it tends to not matter that much. So, uh, huh. I, but I have the, the you know, I, I've used the Tomo Beast alongside all of those Beast series. It's, it's really, it's, I definitely suggest uh, it to anyone. Me and uh, my friend, uh, I'm sure you know Mike Shea, uh, oh, yeah. is, you know, he, he recommends that a lot. Um, he helped playtest it, so, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, who do we know who would run a bunch of, like, CR 17, 20, and 22 monsters? Yeah. Oh, let's ask Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he, he uh, and I talk about, like, that a lot, mostly because my, I think one of my complaints for, uh, for 5th edition was that it, it just didn't have enough monsters to use. Like, they put up the, the, uh... D D Beyond Compendium, and I was like, I went to the Fey thing, and there's like five Fey monsters in Fifth Edition. I know, and I'm like, ah. it's not enough. We want more. Well, uh, I mean, and it it happens all the time, right? Like you said, the Pathfinder best series. I think they're up to five or they're six. They're bringing out their sixth soon. Yeah. Yeah. So six is coming, and there's five, and then there's some extra supplements like for their setting. Yeah. I don't know. They aren't they aren't really best series. So it's like, okay, well if you know, if you've got 2,000 monsters on tap right there, they're pretty well set. But no, they're bringing out number six. There's there's a real appetite for it. Yeah, the um the I think the thing about the Pathfinder beat series that are really really cool is, um, 
I mean, if you if you look in them, they're not all wholly divided into them, but some of them you can very much tell like where their minds are when they were making it. I think oh, it's yeah. I forget whether it's four or five, but there's one of the the later ones has like an entire block of like just like Asian themed monsters. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And it's like, oh well, this is great. Clearly, they're planning on doing something with. Asian themes, or or if they're not, and I don't think I don't think they came out with anything that directly used all those. But even still, it's like, oh, if I if I happen to be doing something in a setting that th- you know that needs those things, now I have those creatures. And uh, for me, right. again, I often will f- like the reason I love having Beast here, just m- as many as I can get my hands on, is because first of all, the art is always really really cool, and it's like, oh yeah, I get so much inspiration from my games just flipping through them, and it's like, oh, that's cool. Can I use that somewhere? This is exactly how I designed, like, every campaign throughout <laughs> high school and college. Yeah, basically. Like, and then, actually, when Wizards said, hey, would you, you know, write Horde of the Dragon Queen? I'm like, fine, hand me the monster manual, and I'll tell you whether I can write it. And they're like, well, we're still working on it, but here's the list. <laughs> so I, I just look at the list of monsters. Those are my options. And if those are inspiring, then I've got something great to work with. Yeah. And if if I feel like, mm, I've done all these monsters, I'm totally jaded and cynical, and it's like, oh, i got to make up a new monster to scare my players with. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually why I really I, it's been really interesting to use uh to do the um first of all I I don't know how familiar if you're familiar with it at all but I've, it's been really interesting to do the open legend setting the horror game that I've yeah been in because I'm not like I'm not using monster bestiary monsters per se I'm like it's literally just the most horrible thing that I can think of and then just finding a way to <laughs> like some some way to mechanically describe that. Yeah, this is, I mean, whenever I do monster design, and it's one of my favorite bits of game design, Yeah, it's always like, okay, what's the hook? What's going to make somebody say, ooh, or, oh, no, make it stop, um, right? Like, if uh, there was a Pathfinder monster I did ages ago called um, the Shining Children, and they're basically radioactive, brightly glowing Kind of like greys if they were on fire. Okay. Um, you See, know, no, I, w- I was literally thinking like they were just the kids from The Shining. What, you know, they could have been. <laughs> but my, my thought was, it's like, okay, these are demons who live on the surface of the sun or they're from the elemental plane of fire and they're just on fire all the time. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's a cool visual. You can kind of see they're they're skeletal or demonic and they have a big smile and they're on fire. Yeah, okay. They didn't become interesting to me as monsters until I said... What if they set you on fire? Oh, yeah, now it's interesting, right? Um, Because the moment I told the party, well, it's a fire monster, they all went, yeah, whatever. And when I said, your halfling rogue is on fire, uh, it was a totally different reaction at the table. It's like, what do you mean? (laughs) He's on fire. That's what this monster does. You're, You're on fire. It's like napalm. Everybody suddenly was like, can we create water? How do we put this out? Yeah. So yeah, play with fear. Oh yeah, make them, I, make them sweat. I, I love um I love monster design. That's just like uh I, I love any well anything any kind of adventure design that uh that really kind of reaches into uh into players like so uh, this is this is something I talk about now. It doesn't it doesn't uh, it t- I talk about this a bit because one of the most common questions I've gotten um as a DM and on this show and in other places and I'm sure you've heard it too is like. You know, people ask, how do you do certain things in D&D, as it were? And one of the yep. most common questions is, like, how do I do horror in D&D? Uh, right. Because it's easy to make a really gross monster, right? It's really to make, sure. okay, this monster's dripping with blood, and it looks really, like, it looks like a bloated zombie, and you don't want to touch it. And then people are like, ew, that's gross, and then I hit it with my sword, and then, okay, it's dead. Because right, and that's you, it. Yeah, because no. you get into an encounter, you know that you're design, it's designed for you to face this thing, and mm-hmm. you're designed to fight it, and it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but you're going to win. Uh, but so, obviously, you know, I, I say to do horror especially requires a little bit of buy-in on the hand on the part of the players but uh one of the interest the most interesting things about horror as a genre is um it works best when you sub when you take the rules that the players are expecting and you just kind of turn oh, yeah. them on their heads so for example yeah. if a player like you said if a player expects to go with you know hit this thing with a sword 
and it dies, that's the rule that the game has taught them. You, right. okay, how can I find a way to take that rule and throw it out the window? Yep. And, and thus, as, the rust monster was invented, right? Yeah, basically. And it's, as soon as the players realize, okay, the things that I know about this game and the things that I, you know, that I think I'm supposed to do don't work here, they feel, they start feeling helpless and they start feeling, you know, out of their element. And that is... I think all great encounters kind of have an element of that to them. Sure, sure. I mean, I love throwing the occasional encounter where it's a cakewalk and everybody's best power works and it's all goodness. But but, but for me as the game master, the, you know, that's satisfying for the players. Cause like, oh, my character does what it's supposed to do. But for me as the game master, it's the horror, the your tricks don't work here um, stuff that, that can be really fun to watch as they they get creative uh with their solutions i i wish i'd you know somebody had recorded the video the first time i don't know who gary gygax said all right you hit the monster and your sword dissolves into rust right yeah <laughs> the first guy to meet the rust monster what was his reaction it was what no that's not fair <laughs> yeah, that's not yeah right. basically because because I mean, but again, because that's kind of the that's the rule you expect is like you you know you expect you it's an RPG you get gear right oh yeah and your gear is used to kill things like you don't really ever expect that the the DM is going to say hey that thing that you really love and that you cherish and you spent a lot of time working to get yeah it's not there anymore right oh man yeah talk about uh, upping the stakes on your players every time you go after their gear like. <laughs> theft and rust monsters and disenchanting anything yeah there's all of a sudden it's not eh, i hit it it, it it gets personal right their, their are, reaction is different uh sheds are in chat is saying that the rust monster was invented because uh gary wanted to use a, a, pla a plastic toy <laughs> oh he, yeah so it he, was one of the hong kong toys the the bullet belay i don't even know how to pronounce it it was from the same thing i remember there was like a some of the real iconic D and D monsters come from yeah. these Hong Kong things. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure the look came from that, but probably not the, the yeah. monster. Design. Oh, not the powers or anything. What it no, did, yeah. right. That's all. That's all original. But yeah, that's right. He had a cool mini. <laughs> that's well. Uh, that works too. <laughs> yeah, that's actually okay. So here, here's a funny thing uh, that happened to me recently. It's like uh, I was talking to one of my friends who was playing in another game, and you know how. Uh, uh, um, Reaper just did a whole those bones Kickstarters where they oh, uh, yeah. they they just made a and and so everyone I knew was buying up these real cheap minis and my friend was like he's like all right so I I, I think I know what our next campaign is gonna be because I just saw the DM unboxing a Kraken mini and I'm like that's <laughs> that that's a good way to tell what he's writing uh -huh. just, just see what minis he's he's painting. That's right. If he's got, you know, 20 knolls and a kraken and, yeah, he, try to figure it out. If he's working on that big red dragon, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so why don't we shift gears a little bit and, uh, cause I know you guys, um, uh, you guys have a whole bunch of products that, um, a whole bunch of different supplements and stuff that oh, sure. you want to talk about. And for those of you who have been, uh, hanging out with the channel for, since way back, you know that we, uh, we had, um, uh, some people from Kobold Press on quite a while ago, and that was, I think, that was just as their Southlands book was uh, was being released, yeah. and we, we saw all the really cool art and design from there. But uh, uh, you guys have done quite a bit since then. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that was uh, that was a real highlight. The Southlands campaign setting is when we first started working with uh, Anna Maya, the cart cartographer who does so much Greyhawk work. That was yeah, that was what he told what he told us. Yeah, and uh, and Ben McFarlane and Brian Suskind did, did a ton of design, and that book came out really well. Um, and since Southlands, that was actually also one of our first big color monster books. We did the Southlands Bestiary as part of that that project. Um, since then, wow, how much have we like kickstarted and put out there? And um, well, uh, we have done. Um, I believe the Advanced Races Compendium for Pathfinder was 25 monster races. Mm -hmm. We've done the Tome of Beasts, the 400 new monsters for 5th edition D&D. &D. Oh, yeah. Um, we have kickstarted uh, Demon Cults and Secret Societies, which is going to ship in like 
a month or two. It's 13 chapters of villains, minions, and world-ending plots. Um, I love villains so much. That book is... I mean, it didn't kickstart huge, but it's certainly funded and has an audience. But it's like, man, give me a good villain and I can run a campaign for months. Oh, yeah. So, um, So that one is coming in June, I believe. Um, and then most recently, like a month ago, we we wrapped up the crowdfunding part of the Midgard Kickstarter where we've got a new player's handbook, our whole fifth edition setting, expansion for the Pathfinder side. I mean, Midgard's been in print for us for five years, this dark European fantasy with with several non-standard races really is, is kind of the hook. There's... Um, there's dwarves and some elves and, eh, you know, you've got your... Your traditional human stuff, but we also got the troll kin, the raven folk, the gear forged construct type stuff, a little bit like Eberron. Um, and then the really weird ones like, oh, I don't know, the bear folk or the insect race, um, the Tusculi. So those are from the Southlands, actually. So uh, Midgard is so big and there's so much of it, it's like impossible for me to wrap my brain around, like, how do I describe that to new players? But, yeah, super dark fantasy, super European, tons of adventure support. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I've been working on it for a year. I expect to ship it at the end of this year. Um, yeah, I'm awesome. so happy with how it's turning out. And Anna Meyer, who did the maps for Southlands, is also yeah. doing the new Midgard maps. So you're going to be able to take the poster map from one, in theory, and line it up with the map from the other. Um, the style will match perfectly. So. Awesome. I, uh, so the, uh, I, I have actually, I, I have a few of the books. I'd have to go back to my, uh, to my thing and, and check which exactly, but I know I've, uh, I know I've, I've t- stolen a few details here and there from the, the Midgard book that I've had for Pathfinder for a while. Uh, cool. and it looks like Firebringer and Chad, he's saying he's also excited to see it. Do you, um, I guess since, since that's your kind of, uh, that's your kind of bigger. I, I, I guess I guess you call it the the flagship setting that you guys have. Yeah, I mean it's the house setting for Cobalt Press, um, and it was the setting that happened by accident, right? Like ten years ago, eleven years ago, I said we're just going to create generic supplements that anybody can drop in anywhere. Yeah. Um, and that lasted about a year or two until people started saying, "Well, we need a default setting. We need some backdrop," and that's kind of where. Midgard as a published campaign happened and it is the way of things. I'm like, well, I happen to have a house campaign that I've been running for years. Let's use some of that. Um, and it's just gotten better and better over time as, um, I mean, everybody from like Jeff Grubb to Ed Greenwood, um, to Brandon Hodge has, uh, has contributed to the setting. Um, and some of the new writers like Dan Dillon are, are no, uh, are turning out some pretty awesome chapters as well. So, you know, in the way of shared worlds, it just keeps getting more interesting over time. Mm-hmm. And bringing it to fifth edition is is a blast too. Because I don't know if it's fair to say that people are are looking for another setting. They've got Ravenloft and the Forgotten Realms, right? Yeah. That's a lot, but. I think there is a certain proportion of the gaming audience that remembers like second edition when it seemed like there was a new D&D campaign setting every other year. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And, and now there's just like, well, no, Wizards is clearly focused on the realms and they've done Ravenloft, but they're not they're not doing like setting after setting after setting. So something like Midgard comes along and it's change of pace. Yeah, the uh, fifth edition is is a little bit interesting in the sense that like um, I guess fourth edition sort of did the same thing in the sense that they took like their points of light setting and they based everything in that and now you know now they're doing all forgotten like yeah Ravenloft I think that's an aside but it's like all every adventure everything that they publish is for Forgotten Realms and the Sword Coast and all that stuff um, yeah and. There's, I, I think it's, you know, there's, because the, the system of 5th edition is so popular, with it being so popular, there's, like, there's definitely those people who are, like, who are going to be hungry for something that isn't Forgotten Realms. I know I, I knew nothing about Forgotten Realms on, until I started running 5th edition, because it's like, you pl- we played the adventures, you didn't really have much choice but to kind of, you know, learn right, what you, they you gave you. you picked it up. 
you know yeah. uh but yeah cuz you know there's always going to be those people who want to homebrew and want to do this and that and among those people who want to do something outside the official stuff there's going to be those who want to do a homebrew but don't necessarily want to write their own setting and so uh you yeah. know you have a lot of a lot of room to create i think that's why i like uh i i kind of like what um what paizo did with golarian is cuz they just have so much room to create new weird settings and stuff oh yes i mean they're big kitchen sink type campaigns like the realms and galarian where there's room to put just about anything right yeah. you want you want your robot section all right we'll figure something out you want genies yeah, yeah we got that you want giants we got room for that um and midgard is a little more focused like you know we pick and choose our flavors there's seven main regions maybe eight now but but it still tries to present like at least you know, a fistful of flavors that yeah. you can you can pick from, because you know you want to give people a chance to travel around and try different things. So, um, so most campaign settings wind up as kind of a tapestry of, of main strands. Um, it's rare to have stuff like Dark Sun, which really just breaks the mold and says, "Okay, it's gladiators, brutal survival." Uh, fading magic, right? Uh, but, and you're all gonna die of thirst. Go. But that, but that's the thing is like th a thing like Dark Sun and you know and even going back like even like Spelljammer and stuff like, sure they're just so out there that like but they're also awesome. Like I love Dark yeah. Sun. It's <laughs> I know it's crazy I, good. I love that second edition sense of we're just going for it. Right here's yeah. Planescape. Here's Spelljammer. Here's Dark Sun. Wow, there's three second edition settings that, you know, nobody's going to mistake that for generic fantasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's there's room to change it up. I think Ravenloft was a nice step in that, that direction for 5e. Um, I think on the Pathfinder side, actually, doing Starfinder kind of feels like that, like... I mean, the, th the thing about Starfinder that's interesting is uh, I don't know how much, how closely you follow their content, but uh, their uh, they had their Iron Gods adventure path, which was the first time they really addressed in large section the technology stuff because right. Iron Gods was like this desert setting with robots and technology that came from the sky, and so they because of that adventure path they made like the technology guide and. The, yeah, the and that was popular. The Android race and stuff. Yeah, and then they were, then I I cuz all of the like the alien races that they introduced in that uh, adventure and a lot of the planets and the concepts and the things that they addressed as like fluff but not like s directly related to the story. Yep. are very obviously the ba like the androids, the aliens and stuff. Those are very obviously the basis for Starfinder and they just kind of expanded oh, yeah. from there. Yeah, I think they saw it was popular, and they saw that they, you know, people said, hey, you've done a good job with this Iron God stuff, where do we get more? Yeah. Um, and and that's the direction they, they chose to go with it. I, it's pure science fantasy. It's way more like Barrier Peaks than it is Traveler. Yeah. Right? I, I think... But they've got a... They've no, got no. a starship combat system, right? So, I mean, it's science fiction, too. I haven't read it yet, but I think there's... there Because I'm not really a sci-fi guy I, as a DM. I don't really DM... Like, I have no real... No real pull towards DMing a science fiction game. But I think if I did, Starfinder would probably be one of the ones that I would gravitate to. Mostly because... Yeah. It seems... It, it's sort of like Star... In the, in the Star Wars sense, like, it's... It's technically oh, yeah. sci-fi, but it's, you know, very obviously that kind of more operatic fantasy than it is like right we've got lightsabers and yeah there's psychic powers and yeah that's definitely not your um you like know. it's not like your shadow run your cyberpunk it's it's no, i think no, it's no. more it's more like uh, like uh, space fantasy than anything else yeah which i think is a blast right i yeah. mean i might if i were running science fiction it might be more firefly meets traveler kind of thing um but that's because that's what I played back when um, Cobalt Press has long time ago said, Hey, we're not a science fiction house. Other people do that really well and better than us. Mm -hmm. We're just going to do fantasy and horror and leave it at that. Um, so I'm excited by Starfinder, but I'm not going to run it and I'm not going to publish it because it's not really what we do. We, we yeah. got to keep focus, focus on what we do best. So. Yeah, um, actually, now, so I, I was talking to my chat a little bit, and uh, I made sure to 
tell them if they, if you guys, by the way, if you're in chat and you have questions that you want to ask, we're going to kind of, normally I split it half and half, but we'll, uh, we'll take questions throughout the show. So if you have any questions you want to, uh, you want to make sure, uh, you get in, just drop them in chat, make sure you tag at exploding dice. So I see them, uh, and we will, we will answer them no matter how personal. Uh, oh, yeah. what did you just promise people? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but uh, so my my, my friend. I see. Fi- I see how this show is gonna go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Man. Don't be afraid to get weird. No. Um, <laughs> my friend uh, uh, Firebringer. He says. Uh, so why now? I know the answer to this, but I will let I will let you tell the story. Uh, why okay. Kobold of all monsters to use for the name? Oh man, there's so many reasons, but um, part of it is. All right, there's like three answers to this, right? There's the, there's the German answer, there's the chemical answer, and there's the and there's is, the underdog. Wait, is, the, answer. is there a German answer in German? Yeah, I, I can do it in German if you like. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, if it's the German answer, it can't be. It's like no, this this answer only works in in German. I can only tell this. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you the chemical answer first, right? So way back when in college, I got a degree in biochemistry. Um, and and so elements are important. Alchemy is important. I always thought it was amusing that the cobalt and the element cobalt are really the same word, right? Because miners thought that cobalts were the ones knocking around on the, the shafts of mines. And you find cobalt down in the mines. It's this blue element that has various interesting metallurgical properties. So there's... There's like the nod to cobalt, cobalt, uh, their homonyms, their, they remind me of back when. The German answer is, nah, cobalt is in Tiere, die aus der Deutschen, oh god, my German's not that good, uh, die Deutschen Erzählungen stammen und uh, als so ein Ungeheuer sind sie mir sehr geliebt. Wow, I managed that. Um... <laughs> Anyone in chat can trans. I will translate myself because what the hell? <laughs> I mean, kobolds, kobolds are monsters from German mythology, and with a name like Wolfgang, um, do I love German myths and legends? Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> that's that's sort of where that goes. And then the last answer is sort of the um, it's the screw you guys answer. It's kobolds are almost impossible to wipe out. And when I started Kobold Press, I said we're the underdog. We're always going to be the underdog. Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast is a billion dollar publicly traded company. We will never compete with them on a level playing field. So we won't try. We're going to be kobolds. We're going to live in, you know, we're going to live underground in caverns and cellars and basements, eating ramen noodle and making traps uh, and and honing things for the day that somebody falls into our trap. Um, and so, yeah, as a survival strategy, it's let's be small, but let's be fierce. Um and let's just do one thing thing really well rather than trying to rule the world. So uh, that's where Cobalt Press comes from. Um, we've survived 11 years, which is an incredible period in <laughs> for any small business and certainly in tabletop gaming. Uh, yeah, I don't know that a lot of companies make it that long. So... I just want to point out, by the way, that none of those answers were the ones that I le- that was the answer that I learned via Wikipedia. So, what do you trust Wikipedia? I someone wrote it. <laughs> oh, cool! I should go check that answer out. What was that answer? Oh, it was probably about Cobalt Quarterly or something. It, the basically the uh, the Wikipedia said that when uh, I forget whatever whatever the company was before it was called Cobalt Press, uh, oh, yeah. your title was the Cobalt in Chief. Yes, yes, I was. That was my job title because, well, yeah, uh, we called it Open Design because yes, we had the open. That's right, the Open Design project. Yeah. Yep, and so we we brought people in, and it's like, eh, we we did a lot of brainstorming. We still do some of it, but um, very much the open door kind of company. But at some point, people said, "Well, you can't just have an open door. You need to follow the open gaming license, and you need to put everything in the public domain, and it needs to be open source." And then. Like, the word open confused people. Mm-hmm. Um, and at a certain point, I'm like, okay. I, I mean, I thought we were pretty clear about this, but we're not open source. We're a tabletop gaming company. Um, and we said, well, let's, let's go with the Cobalt thing, which was the name of the magazine we were doing four or five years ago. So, yeah. 
I don't know. It's a fun company. I'm I'm not unlikely to change the name again. <laughs> no, I, I think it's uh, 11 years now. It's about time. Yeah, yeah. I think. <laughs> you think so? Is that <laughs> overdue? Oh, God, the paperwork. No, don't make me do it. Um. So once again, guys, if you have, uh, if you are in chat, feel free to drop some questions in. I actually have some, uh, uh, some stored away that I will try and find uh, oh, wow. because we had, um, so we had, a, we had a, a show a while ago where we talked about uh, basically independent like publishing and getting into that stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to oh, find man. where I put all of those questions. Oh, uh, I may not be your, able to though. You're off on that topic. I <laughs> mean, I. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wish – how to put this? A lot of people were very kind to me when I was starting out. <laughs> and I would like to repay the favor to other people who are just starting out because there's a lot of things that aren't obvious about starting a small publishing company or working in the game space. Um, and if you're a fan and you're just doing it because you love it and you don't want to make any money at it, that's fine. Um, but you don't want to lose your shirt on it. And, and I don't want people to feel like, you know, they haven't given it their best shot. I want people to, to publish their coolest thing and maybe be the company that I'm applauding at the next Ennies awards or whatever. Um, it's always been a really welcoming kind of community in a lot of ways. People know how hard it is to survive as a games company. Um, and so, I don't know. Me and the other smaller press folks tend to be mutually supportive. And at not every convention I attend, but many conventions I attend, I'll do the like freelancing 101 panel or the self publishing 101 panel mm -hmm. and, and try and spell it out. So, yeah, if you got questions on that direction or if people in chat want to say, I just want to get started on DM Skilled, what do I do? Right? I, I can speak to those i think that's uh that actually um that is something that uh, i so i found some of my questions i stored them on multiple documents for some reason uh the uh I, this uh, we had a, a chatter uh gold 900 he says um uh that he, he says i want to get uh I, I have an idea to get started uh in fifth edition putting out small adventures sort of like the old tsr pamphlets uh, yeah. Yes. Where would be the best place to start for that? Okay. Um, well, assuming that they are, gosh, I have a lot of questions back. Like, do you want to do them in print or PDF? And I, I, wanna... I think it's safe to assume most people don't uh, are most people have no intentions of going to print these days, like physical print these days. Yeah. I mean, and that's still sort of weird to me. <laughs> it's like, like oh, we still make paper things. But but I think PDF is probably smarter as a starting point anyway. You can still lose a lot of money as a PDF publisher, by the way, but, but it's less likely. It's lower risk. Um, so let's assume for a minute that you're just – you're not sitting on a winning lottery ticket that you want to turn into a, a stack of books mm -hmm. uh, or, or pamphlet modules. Um I guess the place to start is, okay, you've got some adventure ideas and you want to share them with the world. Um, I mean, that part hasn't really changed. You need to write it out. Um, you need to play it a few times yourself. You need to play it with strangers, ideally at a convention, somebody who, you, who doesn't already know your play style. Um, this is sort of the worst... The worst feedback in the world is from your friends and your mom, right? Because they're yeah. always going to say, that's the best. You did such a great job, um, no matter what it is, right? So get some friends uh, to, to get you, like, to write it out the first time and design it out the first time. But then take it to a bunch of strangers. Or if you really want to see how well your, your adventure design is working, hand it to one of your friends and watch them run it at a convention because mm -hmm. <laughs> they won't do it the way you obviously knew it was supposed to be run, yeah. right? And they'll, they'll flail around with, I don't know where this villain's stats is. There's no treasure in this room, guys. And you're like, no, no, there is, <laughs> right? So it's like oh, yeah. it's one of those playtest moments. Um, 
so that's like the reality check of is this good? Are people going to have a good time? And by that I mean, are people other than you going to be able to read your manuscript and get something out of it to the point where you can say, yeah, I'm proud of this. It's cool. It's got some neat twists. It's got great monsters, big finale, great hook. Whatever it's got, it's it's got in in enough um, power that that somebody would say, yeah, that was great. I you know tell their friends to buy it. Um, so step one is have something worth publishing. Um, and then step two is, yeah, you think it's worth publishing, but if you really kind of want to take it and make a splash the first time out or, or, you know, make the best first impression you can, um, it's a tough trade off between like editing and art. But if you ever plan on selling a thing, I, this is a bitter lesson for me, but yeah, you really need some good cover art. Mm-hmm. Sucky cover art can turn people off, and that's actually um, that's actually something that I, uh, I I want. I well, it's it's a point that I really uh, I really think is important to to make, mostly because, and this is uh, from personal personal experience. Uh, you we we I mentioned it a few times, but you know the uh, the open legend system. The, yeah. Uh, so so my friend Brian wrote it long a, a while ago and i was uh i had just met him when i just started streaming and he yeah. said like I, he was one of my very first guests on the show and so he sent me the link to his website and he was like here's here's my system now if you run a talk show like i do or you're or i'm i'm sure if you're in the independent publishing business as you are you've probably seen a million and one people send you a thing say here's my game system that i'm working on can you read yep. it you know yeah and one of the the most common things is that it just looks like a word document that they you know that they just typed right. up and it, it's yep it doesn't you know so it doesn't stand out but when when I went to his site he had you know he had commissioned artwork he had some really really good artwork just you know right, right there to grab you on which made the presentation look slick and even if it wasn't a professional product it makes it look like it is and right it. Yeah, and it's really important, right? That first impression is all about, well, what is this game? Yeah, and and nobody's gonna read your amazing prose and your awesome mechanics if they're not even like a little, like you got to sell them the sizzle first, right? Yeah, and this this is a lesson that took me a long time to learn because I come from the design, edit, the word side of yeah, of RPGs, right? And it's like. Words matter. The content matters. That's all true. But if you want someone to like give you a chance and look at the words, you you got to have something. And I would say if it's just one piece of art, right, spend whatever art budget you have on that one piece and make it your cover. Um, it's not going to be Todd Lockwood or, or, you know, pick your favorite cover person. But um but it'll be something, and then you get to you get to give that artist some direction. Say, here's what I want. Yeah. Um, and it yeah, it makes such a big difference. Um, what other advice would I have to just getting started? I mean, once you've got text that content that matters, that somebody who goes out plays it says, yeah, that was great. I'd recommend it. Where's your? What you really want after they read it is you want them to say, so what are you doing next? Right. Yeah. Um. And I think the idea of small modules is smart because they build on each other. This is how Ed Greenwood got the Forgotten Realms published in the first place. He didn't he didn't do adventure modules. He did like he put the Forgotten Realms into every Dragon magazine article he wrote for like, I don't know, years. And he kept mentioning Elminster and Waterdeep and this place called the Realms. And long before there was a gray box of whatever that was, the mid eighties, late eighties. Yeah. Um he was already publishing the setting in little snippets here and there. So if you put little snippets that lead from one pamphlet adventure to the next PDF to the next PDF, um, you know, you're getting people to come back and say, yeah, you're doing something cool and it's building on itself. And you sort of have these ripples in a pond. And eventually people are going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, these little adventures are great. When are you going to give us that monster book? Or when are you going to give us your big spell grimoire or you know, when are we going to get the big book of villains um, or the setting book, the city book? When's Waterdeep coming? Um, and the minute you have any fans who post reviews or feedback or play test your stuff, those people are gold, right? Mm-hmm. I'd say to anybody who's a publisher, your first and most enthusiastic fans 
are awesome people. You should love them. You should embrace them. They're the ones who will help you fan the flames and spread the word to other people because word of mouth is worth a hundred times more than, you know, hey, I posted about it again to all my friends on Facebook, G+, Instagram, everything. I would highly suggest uh, anyone who is writing something, uh, take a copy of it, like the best looking copy you do, and just send it to people that, you, you know, people that do reviews or people that write a blog or, you know, like put it in their hands. It doesn't matter if they're, you don't need them to buy it. You need them to talk about it. Yeah. I uh, mean, review copies are weird, right? Because it, at one level you're giving away your work. But you know, feels, it's, you need it. You know, how, how but else you need it, right? How, how else, do you get it out there? Cause you can't, cause otherwise you have to convince them to pay you for it in order to review it. And that's never going to happen. That never works. There's a reason like every review system for like, Everything from home electronics to video games. I, yeah, reviewers get free stuff. Why? Because everybody wants the word to get out. Yeah. And and you as the creator of those adventures or, you know, publisher, whatever you want to call yourself, you have the least credibility, even though you love it to death and pour your heart and soul into it. Yeah. Nobody will believe you when you say it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, reviewers are the way to go. Um and they won't love you every time. That's the other bitter lesson, right? It's like you put it in their hands and they say, yeah, it was okay. Yeah. Ah, no. What do you mean? I worked on that for six months. What do you mean just okay? Where did I go wrong? Well, they didn't like it. So you got to build that tough skin up eventually too. Uh, I didn't want to make the, miss this question, so I will get to Shadzar's question in a second. But Shadzar, uh, he he was also uh, he was I guess providing a counterpoint, saying that uh, first of all, you know, when we were talking about publishing your system with art and oh, stuff, yeah. uh, he says, sure. "Well, first of all, Word documents take less bandwidth to email, which I, I don't think that's a, that's a thing. Is bandwidth an email a thing these days?" No, I mean, it's not. We have infinite bandwidth. That's like, I, I could understand trying to download a PDF on like, you know, an old, old connection, but I don't think we're in that, we're in that time frame anymore. But, uh, he, he says if, uh, if the art and the layout was the most important thing, then, uh, D and D itself wouldn't have been published, which is true. Oh, Hey, that's why I started with have content that matters, yeah. right? Yeah, you no. You got to do a thing, play test it, and go. But then, yeah, art but, and layout are like the next level up. But also, but also, you have to understand the paradigm that Dungeons and Dragons came out in. That was the seventies. Oh, yeah. There was no <laughs> such thing as digital media. Like it's you know, it, back then, yes. If if Gary Gygax was wanted to get his thing published, he probably would have had to, you know. He w- probably would have had to make it look all nice and professional, and that would have taken a while to do. You know, it would have yeah. taken effort, it would have taken money, it would have taken a print shop, but you don't need that anymore. You could go into Photoshop and make yourself a cover in, you know, yeah. however long I, I it think, takes you, I guess. Right. I mean, you can still put out a manuscript that looks like Gary Gygax's did in 1974, right? You can do that today. You can say, eh, it's 40-some years later, and I'm going to put out something that looks like nothing has changed in the world in 40 years. And some people will love you for it. Because they'll say, ah, my youth, nostalgia, it's awesome. And other people who were born, like, you know, more recently will say, well, you're not keeping up and you're not trying very hard to to present something in the best way you can, right? Because they're used to a different standard of production values. I don't think there's a right way and a wrong way about that. I love Mm -hmm. the OSR stuff because I'm old enough to love it, but I'm... I'm not convinced that, you know, some 15-year-old kid today with 20 bucks in their hand is going to plunk down for a black and white mimeographed staple-bound book. Right? Yeah. They're uh, just Shed- not. Shedzar also says he says my my internet is metered billing and other countries have uh not unlimited bandwidth as well, which is fair enough, I guess. I I yeah. tend, you know, without sort of I guess without that caveat up front uh, it's, you know, most people, I guess it's generally assumed that most people have first word. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what country that is offhand. So uh, I, I'm sorry if that was a, uh, if that was presumed um, this, but uh, next my, uh, my good friend four uh, is asking a question that I, I think links back to what Shadzar says. So he says, uh, uh, question, what games, systems, and additions does Kobold 
I guess, Cobalt Quarterly, support in taking adventures or something as far as submissions? Oh, uh, well, it's Cobalt Press now. Cobalt Quarterly, the magazine, faded away about five years ago. Um, but yeah, Cobalt Press does uh, support 5th edition D&D uh, and Pathfinder as our two main systems. Um, and we occasionally publish things for other systems that we find interesting. So uh, we have announced a Swords and Wizardry supplement for the OSR. The Swords and Wizardry is that Frog God house system. Um, very old school. Uh, 13th Age, we've done a number of supplements for 13th Age. We used to have a license from Green Ronin to do uh, Fantasy Age stuff, but that license has expired, so we're not, we're not doing anything there right now. Mm -hmm. See, 13th Age, Fantasy Age, Swords and Wizardry. Yeah, those three are like the... We don't do much with them, but we do a little. Really, it's 5th edition and Pathfinder at this point that we're looking for submissions. Um, or... Uh, if you go to the Cobalt Press website, there's a either the About or the Guidelines link. Uh, we'll take you to the Freelancer Guidelines where it talks about here's what we're looking for in art. Here's the sort of blog stuff that we pay for or don't pay for. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of spells out our, our submission process and our open door policy. Um, it's often, I mean... Systems change and tastes change. And 11 years in the business means we actually started with D&D 3.5, mm -hmm. right? And we don't support that anymore um, just because there's nobody really that interested, right? There are people playing it. Yeah. I hear from them once in a while. And every time I hear from them at a convention, they're like, well, why don't you do 3.5 stuff anymore? And I say, well... Probably, um, <laughs> probably won't move too many books in that uh, Yeah, I'm like, department. well... Yeah. Right. Uh, I'll just ask them, so how many 3.5 books do you have? Well, you know, I got a whole shelf full. I've invested in this and that and the other thing. And I'm like, okay, so if I publish, I don't know, this book for 3.5, would you buy it? I'm like, eh, maybe. I don't know. I'm pretty good. I've got a lot of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you just talk me out of ever looking backward, right? Um Because how... people who are playing it are loving it, but in... they're done. Now, uh, the a uh, side point, how... Because obviously 3.5 has kind of run it. Well, I guess run its course in the sense that we're we're now two editions away from that. Uh, you right. Know, but how uh, how far away would, would do you think Pathfinder is from uh, that point? Oh geez, I don't know. I keep thinking that they're going to do Pathfinder 2.0, and they keep saying they're I, never. Gonna I think do that it. I keep thinking they're going to re you know redo it too. Or I, here's what I said. I mean... I, I, I don't know how familiar you are, you are with them, but I said if they ever want to redo Pathfinder, just take it everything you need to write and hand it to Dreamscard Press because they will fucking do it for you. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, it's not my call to make. I, I was ready for a new edi edition of Pathfinder last year. Like, that's when I said, yeah, you know, 5th edition is pretty awesome. What have you Pathfinder people got? Yeah. And the answer was, we're going to do science fiction. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty good, but it's not what I think of as a new edition of Pathfinder, it's like a whole genre change. So, but, but it's still the same rule set, which means it's still, well, sort of, I'm not following Starfinder super closely, I, but yeah, my understanding is they're changing up some of it just for ranged combat, spaceship combat classes. Character generation isn't quite the same. I mean, I, I, I'd have to I'd have to look into it more thoroughly. I I the answers that I got were was that it's pretty much just Pathfinder, but I'll have to I'll have to look into it. But yeah, you you no, you're right. It's like I I was ready for you know a uh, core overhaul too, but they that's not in their have, cards. No, I and maybe they'll change their mind, and maybe they won't, or maybe they'll become the Starfinder company from here on out. Right? I it's really hard to say. I'm pretty familiar with their catalog. I mean, we published a ton of stuff for them and and continue to do so now it's just they're no longer the 800 pound gorilla uh of the industry that they were for many years so things change now he here's a here's another uh side point because uh i i assume you guys have seen that like wizards now is leading or is getting really heavy into supporting roll 20 which is uh yeah. i think a great idea are you guys uh do you guys have any plans in the digital department yes we do so cobalt press just released um its first roll 20 product on the market mm 
Um, it's called Double Dungeons. It's two scenarios, um, full maps, token support, animations for every monster, actions, traps, special effects, lighting. I mean, it's the full smorgasbord. That is something I will um, have to check out. Yeah, it's called Double Dungeons. You'll see it by Cobalt Press. It's in the modules section of the marketplace there. Um, and yeah, let me see I, find that, we hope to do more like it um, if the first one is moderately successful. And I, I think so far people are liking it. Um, and we have more plans with uh, with Roll Plenty in the work. Roll Plenty. Yeah, that sounds great. Roll 20 in the <laughs> works. Uh, but I can't announce those just yet. Um Certainly a few more adventures and a couple other things. And then on the fantasy ground side of things, mm -hmm. uh, the Tome of Beasts is available. Uh, full adventures like Sanctuary of Belches is there. Um, I want to say Cat and Mouse. Uh, if it's not up yet, it will be soon. The Book of Lairs is available um, in fantasy grounds format. And ooh, there's at least one more. Oh, Prepared, I think. I think it's up. Um it's hard to keep track when there are so many virtual tabletops. But yeah, we're going to continue to support digital online gaming in every venue that's open to us. Um, and Fantasy Grounds and Roll20 are the two big ones. That's, uh, that's I mean, that's really awesome mostly because uh, for me it was like, you know, I it was one of those kind of like about time moments when Wizards finally decided to get involved uh, and start oh, yeah. putting their stuff on roll 20. So I, I think that's kind of, that's kind of the biggest shift in, uh, public, you know, in role playing games, publishing is, you know, getting your stuff oh, yeah. to the, to the digital marketplace where a lot of, you know, there, there's a lot of money being traded, a lot of gaming. I know a lot of people are making really good money on the, uh, you know, selling mat packs on roll 20 and stuff. It's sure. Huge and I think market. that's, yeah, I think that's really great for artists and cartographers, right, who are doing tokens yeah. um, or map packs. Um, it's not quite as clear yet that people are doing great selling full modules with, like, animated content. Yeah. Um, it's like that's – I mean, a lot of people who play are either looking for, like, give me the official Storm King's Thunder pack, right, and I just want to play the official Watsy module – or they're home brewing like crazy, and there's not a lot of in between. But that may change. There, uh, I now I haven't I haven't talked to Roll Twenty about this, but has there because the uh, you know Wizards has their their things where like if you buy the monster manual, then you get all the the monster tokens. That, like, do you guys uh, is there? Do you guys have any plans for doing that with like the Tome of Beasts and stuff like that? Tome of Beasts is already available with all the tokens and all the stats associated on Fantasy Grounds, and it's coming. It's coming to Roll Twenty in the near future. If uh, oh, maybe I just announced it on this show. Oh shit! Um, <laughs> you got hot scoosies, guys. It, yeah. Well, I mean, we've been talking about it for a while, but they've been so busy at Roll Twenty. They're doing yeah. such a good job, and their support. I think what they were working on for a long time was, hey, we have this deal with Wizards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we need to support the Monster Manual. And I'm like, okay, well, I can get in line behind the Monster Manual. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I, don't feel, I don't feel that that's a bad set of priorities for you guys. You should do that. Um, and so now that I think they're calmed down a little from that initial rush of, hey, we have an official license. We have all this official content. And now they're looking around saying, well, how about another 400 monsters? Yeah, okay. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, for by the way, uh, let me know if if uh, if any if every, anything was asked. So we uh, we discussed a little bit about um, kind of and all this stuff that you guys take submissions for, and I think all that stuff is also on your the, on the website, uh, which I, I yes, like under the uh, the submit section. For just asked, uh, and I think we were talking a little bit about this, but he says, uh, "What kind of uh, I'm just curious, what kind of tips you have for hopeful writers uh, for DMs Guild that aren't as." familiar with forgotten realms uh basically he says how much freedom do we have in deciding where uh we put our adventure and there's something else that ah okay um well yeah one of the weird things about the dm's guild is that it is so realm specific right it's like if you're doing a homebrew why would you give it away and never be able to use it outside the dm's guild you'd want to publish that on drive through or somewhere else um, 
But it's also one of the big advantages of the DMs Guild that, yay, you get to play in the sandbox that is the Forgotten Realms. Um, in some senses, like you don't have to know the whole history of the realms to place a module there. Um, you can go to any realms wiki and and find some place kind of appropriate and just say, hey, here it is. Um, it's sort of missing the best part of, of having access to their stuff, though. Uh, I mean, if you're going to give up a big percentage of sales and all rights to publish your material anywhere else, which is what you do on DMs Guild, then you should at least be getting the full benefit of, hey, uh, everybody who loves the realms is going to like my adventure a little more because it really takes advantage of that. So, I mean, from my perspective, if I'm going to the DMs Guild as a new writer now, mm-hmm. I kind of want to go hit the hot spots. I want to go hit someplace like the Dale Lands or Waterdeep or, I don't know, Thay, if I'm feeling especially magically evil. <laughs> um, you know, I, go somewhere high profile or go, you know, in the in something that's giant friendly or... Uh, looking ahead at Yawning Portal, right? Like, well, where would those things go? What would tie into that? Yeah. If you're if you're getting access to the canonical IP, everything, Elminster is at your beck and call, right? Then do it. Take the full Forgotten Realms thing and embrace it. Um, don't just kind of... That's actually... You know, put, that's yeah, actually, don't just put... Uh, Go for it. No, no, sorry. I was gonna say the uh, the thing that I've noticed, and this is a uh, is a tip that I I would say if you if you're intent on writing for the DMs Guild and specifically, I think my camera may have skewed. Hold on, uh, specifically for the um, uh, for the Forgotten Realms settings, the most money I think on the DMs Guild, just like the most traffic on YouTube or on Twitch tends to happen right at the launch of a new product so like for example right when the right when storm king's thunder comes out the most money that's going to be made is for people doing supplement products for that you know yeah um when out of the abyss came out tons of trade like i think two of the most popular things on the dms guild are is one guy that just made like two books of encounters that you could just slot in anywhere in the underdark into out of the abyss you know and it's like that's the stuff that, that that's the stuff that people will be looking for. So if you want to uh, if you want to traffic on the DMs Guild, I would suggest keeping up with Wizards' new product line and finding out ways that you can like tie in directly to whatever it is they just launched. You know? Yeah, and that's like the beauty of it, and that's also sort of like the the one cheer tear rolling down my cheek, which is like, you're pretty much tied into their product line if you love the core D and D stuff. If you love the forgotten realms, then you have total access to it and you're right there at launch. You're going to be way more successful. If you want to do original material, these yeah. are the people I cry about, right? It's like, it's a lot your... harder to convince people. Right, to look don't... At that. It's so much harder to convince anyone. And Oh, by the way, you're signing over all the rights to them, right? You, you don't own your world anymore once you put it up there. So, be cautious. Put it on drive through It's not that much harder. Yeah. And you retain the rights. So I think of it as a great, great way to play in the realms or Ravenloft, um, but not a great way to launch any homebrew stuff because it's, it's just a – it's not meant for that. It's meant to promote the wizard stuff. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's – again, that well, that's, that's kind of the thing is like – I, I think that's sort of written into the name, though. You know, if you are doing it on the DMs Guild, it's like it is the official Wizards Dungeon Masters Guild. Like you've sure, you know, if you're going to publish there, you know, you you kind of you should you should expect to be uh, you know to be tied into the fifth edition stuff. But I think it's really cool that they uh, they are now like they're supporting older older settings and stuff with their they have print they have the old books now print on demand. I think. Um, oh yeah, like. Some of the Dragonlance stuff, yeah. and Dark Sun, and I don't know what all so, has been in there. So we might actually see those making, you know, getting fifth edition conversions at some point. Uh, you know, definitely. I, I that's that's my suggestion for the DMs Guild. Obviously, I think it gets less traffic now, but there are like RPG drive through and stuff that you can sell uh, non D and D or non uh, Forgotten Realm stuff on and. Do all right. I don't know how. I don't know how well people generally do on like drive through and stuff. I'm not. I'll just tell you, we sell Tomo Beasts on drive through. 
<laughs> and it does fine. Oh yeah. But it's a big book of D and D monsters, right? Yeah. So yeah, I don't um, know. I don't know how much how I, I I don't know what the traffic is to like smaller modules or uh, supplements. That's yeah. I mean, when your I'm, beginner traffic is always nightmarishly hard. But my hope is that people who do really well on DM Guild at some point kind of level up and say, "All right, I've done enough of my work in the realms. Now I'm hoping that my fans will follow me." To this new homebrew thing, I'm kickstarting over here, right? Yeah. Um, I actually, I, I've been toying with it because the the campaign that I have now, uh, the oh, Rising Moon, like at some point, I I would really love to sit down and write a whole like a whole setting guide for for that campaign. Or yeah, uh, because it is just so weird and everything is just so off the top of my head that I, I feel like at some point, and, and if you, I don't know how you write a setting, but I wrote like this, <laughs> I, I'm a visual thinker cause I'm an artist by trade. So my, uh -huh. my head space is all uh flow charts and this connects yeah. to this connects. It's like a spider web of, of all that. And that's how I plan this world out. Oh man, that sounds not, totally dissimilar to like these are the notes for my home game right which yeah. like they make sense to me and yeah, they're no, all no. i need <laughs> they don't, I don't make sense need... to anyone else and they don't have to right if the audience is me and as long as i remember what the heck i meant i'm good but yeah and then it's like okay let's turn that into a real world book with maps and like information laid out in sequence and in a way that people can find it when they're flipping through the pdf on their tablet later um yeah that's a whole different different animal than it's working for me and working for my campaign i should actually talk to you about that at some point not on the show but i should talk to you after because i sure. desperately want to get a map made for uh for the city that writhing moon takes place in but i couldn't find a good artist to do it Oh, I got a recommendation. Yeah, it's. Could it, try. It, I we'll, mean, we'll talk about it after. I, I was looking right, for a very that? specific type of map, and I couldn't find any artist to do it. And I'm like, oh. I don't want to do it myself. Because the, cartog the cartographers guild just finished their their contest recently. They put their best of 2016 up. Yeah. I don't know if you follow these guys. I, but... I actually used to do uh, used to release work on the cartographers guild a long time ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've I've had pretty good success going there and saying huh what's new what's cool is there anybody here who i want to work with or do i just want to look at the glorious maps and kind yeah. of wallow in like a uh, map you know I, strange, greatness strangely all of the people who are doing really really well on roll 20 uh my friend dave hemingway gabriel yes. picard all those people that are like you know they do crazy good on on roll 20 those th like those two guys were like the class that I grew up with in uh, on the cartographer's guild. We were all like doing the same, doing the exact same type of maps together, and so oh, cool. we, used to, we used to. So talk why aren't you on roll twenty killing it? I you're running this Twitch stream, right? <laughs> I yeah, I went a different direction. No, I I um I used to make uh, like photorealistic battle maps for uh, mostly based on because I was running a lot of Pathfinder Adventure Paths. Still am. Uh, -huh. uh And so I basically, you know, how they print those like kind of low res. Um. Uh. Who's Rob Lazaretti? He's the cartographer. Oh yeah, Paizo yeah, uses. yeah, yeah. So all the Rob Lazaretti maps, I was basically converting into like high res, photorealistic Photoshop oh, constructions, wow. and that was you know. So we were all kind of doing stuff like that, and I never got around to, I, because it took because I'm very slow. And so I, I, I never had time to be like, okay, I can make a pack of these and sell them on Roll20. Uh, I, I was just doing other things. And then I got into streaming and, you know. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the cartography gigs are really cool, but speed is a big part of it. People have an uh, incredible appetite for good new maps. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You which, is why I'm, quick. which is why I'm amazed at the guys who can kind of, like, pump things out. Because I'm like, I, it takes me a month to finish one map. Like, I... I have so little free time. You have no you have no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's kind of the nature of of creativity, right? Some people are are super fast, and I'm like, where? How did you publish another book and another game and another card game and another, or you know, art, art, art? And some people kind of work at the same thing for a long time, and I'm I'm thrilled when it happens, but I I don't look to them every week to check out their latest thing because they don't work at that pace. That's okay. Yeah, that sort of says, um, some of some of the people in my community are trying to get me to do more art. They kind of come hang out with me on my 
one or two creative streams a week where we, we make maps or we make, I have map Monday now, which is my, uh, I, I hang out with these guys and I make a map and I teach them Photoshop and it's, it, I, I, we're, I, I basically, I need my audience to come encourage me to do it. Cause otherwise I will just put it off for, for other work. Um, yeah, it's tough, right? You got a full life, you yeah. got all this gaming you want to do, and then you got to fit in some apps somewhere. I know. Uh, I was I saw some more. If you guys have any other questions, we should have a we should be able to take them for a little while longer. Um, I, you uh, how how are you doing, Wolfgang? <laughs> you know, I'm I'm in that weird between phase where like the Kickstarter's over, the work is in front of me. Uh, I'm real happy with where stuff is going, and I just want to start <laughs> sharing sketches and like blasting out all the coolness that's going into this book or that book. One of the hardest parts of like keeping Cobalt Press going is like learning when to not share everything, so that by the time it actually makes it out in PDF or whatever, people are like, "Oh, this is new," as opposed to, "Oh, I've seen all this on your stream." So that's weird. I know that a lot of artists are having a lot of success sharing, 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 mm -hmm. and I'm I'm like, well, I'm sharing some, but I come from that old school of yeah. Launch it when it's ready, right? Like, I I want people to play test it. I want people to look at this, but I I want there to be kind of a sense of surprise and wonder when you crack it open and say, "Holy cats! Look at that map!" Um. So yeah, it's this weird thing of the the creative dance between I want to show you how great it is, but I don't want to show you everything. Oh yeah, I definitely understand. By the way, I wanted to thank uh, Rolled Up for following before I didn't get a chance to say it. So thank you for joining us and welcome to the madness, my friend. Um, oh man, my friend uh, Four, who is uh, one of my Writhing Moon players, uh, he just dropped a question. He says, uh, "Let's say you des you've designed an adventure or campaign and you know how you'd run it. Uh, what would you consider to be the most important pieces uh, to give over to another DM who might?" Uh, be like purchasing the uh, I guess the campaign or adventure uh, or mm. he says or is it just a matter of building word blocks of info so I guess I guess when you know when you're writing a module like what it, how do you decide what you know what to give a DM so they can sort of just jump into it and or so they right. you know I don't know it, it's a complex question I guess yeah, it really is, because, um, I mean, you write different adventures for different kinds of people, and so the answers, they wobble around a little bit, but, um, but I mean, whether you're giving it to new players or longtime players or your buddy who's going to, you know, run for a few weeks, the, the basics are probably always kind of the same, um, and if it's for publication, then there's a whole other layer of things, but... Um, for me, it's either I'm flipping through the monster book or I'm drawing the map first just to sort of define what's the play space. Mm -hmm. Um, and having the map makes it easy to say, oh, okay, I can put the undead spiders in here, but their size huge, so they won't fit down this tunnel. And then that leads to interesting things like, oh, okay, so I can put dark creepers and dark stalkers here because eh, the undead spider can't follow them down the tunnel. And then... You know, so a lot of it's sort of free form, free flowing. I'm drawing the map and thinking about how the different monsters interact with each other on that map. So that part works for me if I'm running it at home. The minute I say it's something I want to share with somebody, um, all of a sudden I need to like label the map with numbers and not just words. Um, and I need to connect those numbers to, yeah, it's kind of throwing blocks of text at somebody. Um, and depending on what I know about how experienced that other GM is or that audience is, I'll either like copy paste a whole lot of stats there for them just so they have them, or I'll bold face it and say, you know, an undead spider, it's in bestiary four or it's, you know, it's in the monster manual. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Um, I, I won't throw down a lot of monster stats early on when I'm creating because I, they can kind of get in the way of the connecting text. It's like, yeah, unless they have powers that matter, 
to the encounter, I'm like, I can just look at this in the monster manual and then write about it. It's like, okay, what does the undead spider do? And what does it look like? So the things I tend to focus on when I'm trying to pass it out of my brain through the keyboard and onto somebody else are like, okay, what's there? What does it look like, smell like, you know, sound like? Um, and read aloud text is sometimes useful for that because it's like, okay, if I were running this, this is what I would say to my players. And, and so I'll divide each encounter or section or scene, whatever you want to call it, into the, the setup what's supposed to happen, What what's the crucial three things they need to know. Oh, yeah, it's one of my rules of thumb. Um, mm-hmm. I try not to give players more than three pieces of information before I shut up and let them say something, right? Because that prevents me from writing the long, long, nobody wants to hear this read aloud yeah. type stuff. Which, so it's which, like, is a, which is a kind of a, a trademark of Pathfinder Adventure Paths, I find. Oh, God, they love their read aloud text. And I'm yeah. like... No, I'm going to tell you three things, right? There are dwarves. One of them's on fire. The other two have axes. Go, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. You have some idea. They're berserkers or something. Um, I actually, that that actually brings up a thought in my head, uh, mostly because, again, I run a lot of adventures. So I, I love reading box text because I can sort of make box text dramatic i can add like pauses and tone changes and this and that to make you know to add emphasis where ne- where it's oh, necessary yeah. and this and that but the problem is as soon as i don't have box text i i tend to stammer a lot i tend to kind of switch gears and stuff when i'm trying to describe a new room do you as a writer and as a sort of a, a like a season kind of module writer and adventure designer do you ever like do you write yourself basically box text at home i do do you just just wing it at home well at home i don't write box text i write bullet lists um because i I, i'm comfortable enough with my play group and i don't feel any pressure like if i'm going to a convention i'll prep more but at home it's like okay you know berserker dwarves throwing axes hair on fire right that's like three bullet points that's what I need to know for this encounter. And then I'm going to go to like pick up some stat blocks somewhere. I just don't want to overdo it. Um, and then I'll write, in addition to the first three, I'll often write three more. And the one I always forget is the treasure. So I tend to write this down <laughs> in more detail. Um, Cause you know, I care more about where's the story going and is the encounter yeah. interesting and is there stuff going on as a player. And I've been playing through Ravenloft a lot lately. It's like, Man, the focus, the maniacal focus on we need some treasure out of this encounter sooner or later um, is a bigger thing, right? Um, I just think that's a difference in the way designers and uh, and players and DMs look at stuff. It's like, well, I want to balance this. Um, so, yeah, bullet points, a couple of ones that are read aloud like for me. And the, the more prepared I want to feel, the more I'll write that out in detail. Um, <laughs> And the more professional I want it to be, the more I'll write that out smoothly. And you can spend a lot of time on box text getting it down to 50 words or something really pithy and short with a nice punch at the end. And ideally, like the last word or the last phrase of your box text is something that makes everybody go, (gasps) Like, yeah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you always put the, you always put the uh, the most important detail, like because the way I, the way I, fi- I I think about box text is, um, it, you know, in a in a movie when like the camera flies around the room, you know, uh-huh. it always centers on the most important thing right at the end of its mo- uh, the camera move, and so that's right. the way I kind of think of box text is like you describe the broad swath of what they see, and then you kind of come come into some higher level details and then you focus on the thing that is grabbing their attention immediately right and then it's like oh we've been looking for that guy or oh crap we're about to roll for initiative right and they know it's like you're leading the players neatly to okay what sort of reactions (laughs) what are your choices where are you how do you feel about this place and then what can you do next because the worst thing that happens is you read that box text and they all kind of sit there and go Oh, okay. Now what? Yeah, I, I don't know. Check I, I, for traps. I walk in. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, walk in. I have to say, though, I as a DM who runs a lot of modules, one of the things I cannot stand, and Paizo is really guilty of this a lot, and I don't oh, know no. if it's something they don't take, they don't tell their writers. Uh, I, I don't know how, how much Wizards has done of it, uh, because I haven't really, I haven't run any of their, uh, their full, you know, published adventures fully, but... I hate when a bot when uh, you there's a room and there's box text and it does not mention the enemies and then oh, the next no, line under that. that is the enemies. <laughs> like yeah, that's lame. Cause come on, everybody is like on their toes about. And then the, yeah, because we... you get to the end and the DM's like is like and he's like and the root you, you see the the giant chamber and then they're like okay, I walk in they're like, oh wait no there are skeletons there. Yeah, it's like. No, you've missed, I mean, that, it seems like a failure of design, because you've missed the opportunity to give the right first impression of the skeletons, and you've failed to set the tone for the encounter. You've said, this encounter's about an empty room and architecture, yeah. instead of, this encounter's about a bunch of skeletons who want to kick your ass, right? Yeah. I mean, you just, you lost it. You lost the opportunity. So, not everything needs to lead straight to the combat. I, I don't mind encounters that hide the monster, but it needs to be a monster that was hiding in the first place. No, yeah, right? it, it needs to make sense. <laughs> and or, and I think it, you should, if you're going to do that, like, you should at least... So, here here's the thing, because I have the most experience with the, the Paizo stuff, and the thing that I find is they'll go box text, and mm -hmm. then they'll go right into a description of uh, of, like what you know what is leading up to the encounter in this room but they'll they'll bury the monster like a few lines in and it's uh. and so you know you have to read down a little bit so it's like if you're going to do that okay box text and then immediately under it you should be like this room has one uh, like x times one atyog you know right. five hidden <laughs> skeletons you know like a checklist so you know okay it's not in the text but it's there Right. It's, I mean, I like bold. I like bullet points. I like things that bring it to the surface. Obviously, if there's a giant stat block there, I'm not going to miss it. But but part of me as a designer says, if somebody spent the money on the monster manual or six bestiaries, you know, do I want to repeat it and eat up half a page in the we, module? We, or yeah, do I just want to say... You don't no. need this. You don't need the stat block. I don't think. I, I think you just no. need to. You just need to let like because again, Thoglor brings up an, an interesting, like a, an important point. It's kind of the way I was trying to say it is like people are gonna. He says uh, anyone is gonna notice. You know the skeletons clawing their way towards them before they notice like the ornate frescoes on the walls. I know, and that's why I like to. I mean, if you're smart about your design, you you put the combat into the box text, or at least the not the combat the hey, there's a monster in this room. And if you want there to be box text for the uh, mysterious frescoes that have a major clue about the the big bad boss on this yeah. level, well, yeah, write that box text, but write it in after, a position... After the combat. Right, it's after the combat, right? It's like, okay, here's the combat part of this encounter, and then further down here, if players investigate the room and look at the frescoes, here's a big major clue that will tell them something about the big bad boss. And and players who just say whatever we loot the bodies and move on don't get that, um, and that's fine, right? Not every clue needs to be picked up. Um, yeah, so I mean, yeah. Whenever you're writing for an audience, the other thing I, I'd put out as a general rule is kind of over-explain or try to be as as clear and complete as possible, because beginning writers, in particular, beginning adventure designers tend to fill in the blanks sort of automatically and at a certain point you know good gms will will fill in that material for you if you look at old gary gygax adventures it doesn't lead you neatly by the hand through the giants modules there's it's, it's remarkably thin um but i think people now are used to at least a little more um I don't know, fleshing out the options. So it's a really tough line, right? Yeah. On the one hand, you want to give everybody clues and tools and cool descriptive text and awesome treasures. On the other hand, at some point you want to say, okay, I've written 10,000 words or 20,000 words or 30,000 words. Um, you know, How far has that carried this adventure? Have people been having fun the whole time? Or has the, the DM been like flipping back pages forwards and backwards like what was in that 
urn. I don't remember. Is this the wine barrel with the secret key? I don't know. Yeah. Right. Too much junk. I so, so the, there's a couple questions. Uh, some of them have come. I, I and I think I said. Uh, I think you said you you probably would have to uh, have to wrap up in a in a few, in a little while, right? Yeah, give me yeah twenty minutes. Okay, that's fine. We'll uh, we'll we'll give we'll spend some time on these last couple questions, and then we'll kind of we'll kind of wrap things up in a little bit. But uh, so the, a couple of these come from chat. A couple of them are things that I've just been wondering uh, myself. Um, and I guess the the first I, I want to start with uh, is uh, on the forefront in chat. He says, uh, "What is your favorite obscure monster that you think deserves more screen time?" I know my answer to this question. I want to know yours. Oh, that's so hard. I love them all. Um, lately, I've been obsessed with uh, an old Planescape monster, which is actually an old Norse monster, which is the Ratatosk, um, okay, the I... trans-dimensional squirrel messenger of the Norse gods. Okay. Um, I swear to you, it comes from the sagas. It's a squirrel with tusks. It carries messages. It's a trickster. I'm like, squirrels, really? All right, well, you know, if you were a Viking and you were trying to make up a messenger, squirrels are not a bad idea, walking up and down the world tree. And I think there's some adventure possibilities there, but they're kind of on the obscure side. Uh, my Whenever people ask me about... Um... Uh, about monsters, my answer is always Atiog. Always Atiog. Is it really that obscure? It's my I, I, fa- I don't know, but it's my favorite. It deserves way more, <laughs> way more screen time. You're absolutely correct. It's a, a giant poop monster. What's not to it love, is the right? Best, it is the best thing that has ever been in D&D, and I will tell you what the biggest crime against humanity is, is the fact that in 5th edition, they no longer speak common. What? No, no. How how do you have a sewer monster that you can't talk to? That's <laughs> No, but the thing about the Atiog, the reason it's so amazing is because yes, it's disgusting and it's monstrous yes. and it's got these giant mouth and these, you know, tentacles and the one on the back with the three eyes on it and it just wades out of the mud and garbage and you describe this to players and they're horrified and they're like I must yes. kill this abomination and then it's just like hello and they're like, what is going on here? I don't know how to feel anymore. Right. It's talking to me. It's. <laughs> That's why it will always be my favorite monster. I have to say, any monster that, that speaks to the players is instantly in a whole separate category and, and <laughs> improves its odds of survival ever so slightly just because what you can speak. I don't know how I feel it's... about, you know. It, because if because if a monster can uh, here's the thing is if a monster can speak I can convince the players not to kill it. Yes. yes. <laughs> and that, that is always like I don't know about you but in my uh, especially my Friday group so I I have a group that I play Pathfinder with on Fridays I've been playing with these guys for like three years now and they have a horrible habit of any time they get to an enemy and right before yeah. the enemy's about to die they give them a chance to talk. <laughs> they will always let that enemy go. Always. Wow. And they don't think so... they're doing it. They don't think they're falling victim to it. It's just they if they <laughs> if they can get a, if they can have a conversation, I can guarantee that they will let that enemy go. And they oh, think they're fast... they think they're gaining something from it every time. Oh well, maybe they are somehow. <laughs> a sense of moral superior I don't know, man. If I that were my group, I would be making them pay for it occasionally with well, you let him go, and he comes back with friends, right? All those tricks. You know, you, yeah, wow. you can definitely do that, and it's or you can just make them like skip town and never come back. Cause, That's and he's right. Like, he's the guy. Wait, no, but he said he was gonna go do this for for us. Oh no, he was Kaiser Soze. <laughs> Sorry, man. He just it was him. him all along. He killed all those little halfling babies. <laughs> and you let him go. You should feel bad. <laughs> I, I, that's that's why I love that group because I can always count on them to do certain things and that's one of them. It's nice when you've got a group that you've been playing with for ages and you can sort of play into some of their <laughs> foibles or weaknesses. And the the thing to note is they also know your tricks, right? They're like, oh man, we're playing with this guy. We've been playing for years and the one thing we can always count on is Askren's going to do X, right? He's always going to have the bad guy talk to us. <laughs> yeah. 
That's uh, fun. I, I like long term groups, but lately it's been so many like short play tests and yeah. convention games. So actually getting to play Ravenloft now, oh gosh, it's been going on. Uh, I don't know if we've hit the year mark yet. Has it been out of year? But playing with the same group for an extended period has been a blast because we do we do have you know you... a little more of a rhythm as a group than you do in a one shot. Are you guys playing the uh, the fifth edition like Curse of Strahd Ravenloft? Or are you playing yeah, like old sorry. style? Sorry, I call it Ravenloft. I mean Curse of Strahd, yeah. of course. Yeah, we went. We started at the Death House, and we've been going through the whole thing, and we've been having a good old time because we have a group that's slightly too. We're either six or seven players, so yeah, we slightly overpower things, and we wind up uh, in situations that our level doesn't really justify. But um, we haven't lost anybody yet. Knockwood. So. Yeah, uh, Curse of Strahd is interesting. I really wanted to, uh, I really wanted to run it, but by the time I had, I got to like the point where I had a free slot to DM, and I was putting together a cast, and I knew I wanted to do something. I wanted to do ho- something horror style, and really like, because yeah. I, I was doing a lot of a lot of kind of less serious, kind of jokey campaigns, and I really wanted something. Uh-huh. I wanted to stretch my dramatic legs a bit. But by the time I got there, I, I feel like Curse of Strahd had been played out a little bit. Everyone had done it on stream already. Everyone knew well, everything yeah. about it. And it's like, we're we're so far past it that I figured that rather than do that directly, especially because, like, I don't know if you know, but right now, uh, in this time slot, Chris Perkins is running his game. And uh, right. he was running Curse of Strahd <laughs> at the time, and I'm like, uh-huh. how about instead of instead of Curse of Strahd, I'm gonna do something horror, but I'm gonna do I'm gonna do something homebrew, so that it's you know, it's not predictable, and that's kind of so that's why Writhing Moon is kind of my answer to Curse of Strahd. It's you know, oh awesome. Well, see, that's a good way to go, right? No one will duplicate that. Everyone knows that it's gonna be something different. They haven't seen it. Um, I love Curse of Strahd, but yeah. No, I yeah, really, it's... I really like it. It's it's very well written. I got a chance to to play a little bit of it, uh, and by mm-hmm. play it, I mean like enough. We, we I played on a different uh, on my friend's channel, and it, it, he doesn't run anything like it is in the books. Uh, so I think the <laughs> only the only similarity was the fact that we did fight Strahd at the end. Uh, All but right, I, but um, no, it's you know like I. I enc- that's why I'm giving it away with my DMs kit because I think it's a great adventure and I, I encourage people to uh, to check it out. You can learn a lot of design stuff and DMing yeah. and things from it. I mean, the Ravenloft sort of I don't know tradition just goes back through all these iterations um, back to the the original I six. Yeah, and it's like it's the same story, and we all kind of know where we're going to wind up as players in it, and we just don't care because like, these tropes work. Uh, we're in the hands of a very capable GM, and and we're having a great time doing it. So um, the fact that we know, oh, Strahd is at the end of this road, and we'll see how that goes, um, it doesn't diminish our enjoyment of it at all. So, also, yeah. also from a design standpoint, just an adventure design standpoint, I think uh-huh. uh, Curse of Strahd itself is it's such an it's such a straightforward like quest thing. It's like okay, to defeat Strahd, you have to go get these four things and you know you, yes. to, you find where they are and they're going to be in this little self-contained world and then once you find all of them you go fight them like it's such a basic story but there's so much interesting padding to it that it i yep. don't think it ever feels like a trope no no and i mean there's yeah there's a lot of clever design in it um and it's certainly a story that is sort of woven itself into D D in a lot of ways. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just happy they brought it back and that Chris Perkins wrote it because it's, it's a blast. Yeah. So I'm also looking forward to the giant nostalgia of Yawning Portal. That's, um, yeah, that's a that's a big thing. And this is, I get so much flack for this, but um, uh, Tomb of Horrors is one of my favorite modules ever. All right, you <laughs> and me both. I, I get a lot of flack for it for the same reasons you do probably it's like <laughs> yeah, it, it has all those flaws and i don't care i love it anyway it's, it's it, it has so many flaws but i think in a lot of ways like uh and i actually had so many interesting conversations about it with uh with game designers and stuff like that um uh steve lumpkin and adam Cobol and, and you know, oh yeah that. and we we talked about this and i think we came to the decision that it i think it's a master class in uh how to kind of put players in a situation and that teaches them the rules of the, of what they're going into. But Mm -hmm. you know, 
and, you know, while also kind of subverting a lot of expectations, the major problem I think with it is the, all the rules that it teaches players are probably the most boring ones. Yeah. You know, in, in yeah. how, how you explore a dungeon and this and that. Like, it teaches you everything about it. It's just that the way that you're so, it kind of expects you to go about doing things is a, li- a little less, you know, it, it, very monotonous. Yes, yes. And I think, you know, there are many other adventures that I, I love dearly, but it I, part of me just loves it because it's ruthless and the, the way it imparts lessons is, hey, you're disintegrated, right? Yeah. I mean, that is that is something that um, that I love because for a long time in 3rd and 4th edition, there was a real sense of, eh, player risk has been mitigated to a large degree. Um, yeah, yeah. Whereas in first and second edition, it's like smart play was important because you had less resources to draw on in terms of feats, in terms of uh, just resources generally. I I feel like there used to be um, a different social contract between players and DMs than we yeah. had in some of that period. Not that it's wrong um, that one is more enjoyable than the other. It's just a different social contract. And I, I noticed it really closely when I was playing um, an old game from the 70s, Empire of the Petal Throne, believe it or not, the the weird Mesoamerican space fantasy thing, which pretty much assumes that player characters are going to die in droves, right? It's just like, mm. yeah, characters, whatever. They're around, then they die. <laughs> like, Wow, that was role playing in the seventies, I guess, right? The the body count was huge. Yeah. And so in that environment, Tomb of Horrors is just like, yeah, whatever. You're gonna lose a bunch of people. Um and at some point in second edition, I think there became the start of that, well, your character is gonna stick with you for a longer time and you can get more attached because the odds of them disappearing are well, not entirely mitigated, but some. I don't know. That that may be something that changed over decades or maybe that my perspective on it has changed as i've gotten older but i'm perfectly willing to go back to yeah, let's kill them off <laughs> um so i actually want why don't we uh uh why don't we make this kind of the, the last question we'll, we'll discuss here and then we'll start wrapping things up uh sure. i'm really interested because you you guys especially uh you know kobold as a whole and i know you have a, a long history of writing different types of modules and adventures and stuff. What would you, what would you say is probably your, uh, your favorite type of adventure to construct? Like if, if uh, do you, do you have any, any particular styles that you lean heavily on when like dungeon crawls, wilderness exploration, hex yeah. crawls? Well, I think you'll see it in the publishing history at Cobalt Press. We love dungeons, but we don't actually publish that many of them. Mm-hmm. They have to be awesome for us to, I mean, like we did, I don't know. Halls of the Mountain King is all dungeon, but but it's the exception. It's more common, at least for me personally as a designer, and and probably for Cobalt Press, um, we lean more on urban adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, we probably had our biggest success with Streets of Zobek, which won the Gold Annie as the best adventure um, of the year, twenty thirteen, something like that. Um, and it's basically the noir. Don't bring the palette in. Dark yeah. side mean streets type stuff which we love um and the other stuff that we do a lot of is um how to put this uh brothers grim for grown-ups right um it's fairy tale it's changeling it's the dark side of the fae i mean two modules that i poured a lot of myself into were courts of the shadow fae and wrath of the river king mm. both of which have to do with Hey, you're gonna go visit the Fae, and oh, by the way, it's there's yeah. gonna be plenty of combats. Um, but your barbarian's also gonna get insulted um, and you know told to stand in the corner. And because the Fae glamour and enchantment is what it is, and his will saving throw is what it is, um, you know the barbarian's gonna spend some time standing in the corner while the rest of the party has an adventure. Um, it's it's full of trickery and tropes and manipulation and um, the kind of design that says what you see is not necessarily what you see and your initial mission um, turns into, oh my God, could we just please get out of the fairy realm? Um, so I love adventures that 
to take classic fairy tale stuff and turn it dark, dark, dark. Uh, and that's what both of those do um, with, you know, whatever degree of success people think they have. But I, I have a blast with those. And it's super niche. And it's not the kind of thing that I want to run every week or write every week. Yeah. Um, but when I'm in the mood for it, it's like, give me a plane of shadows and um, a bunch of nobles who are up to no good and, oh, a golem full of eyeballs and the heart of the sun, <laughs> right? And that'll, that'll work. Oh, and put Baba Yaga in the corner, right? And let's <laughs> make... If you go to the stables, you see some chicken legs in the stall next over. Uh, what chicken legs? Well, they're really big. They're like ogre size. <laughs> have you ever um, Have you ever read my? I think my favorite game mastery module uh, is. Um, it, it sounds like it would be something right up your uh, right up your alley. Uh, it's uh, written by. It's called Carnival of Tears by Tim Hitchcock and Nicholas Logue. Oh my god, those guys are geniuses, yes. both of them. And it's my favorite yes. holiday adventure. It's like a winter carnival, and uh -huh. the players spend half of the adventure just going through this carnival and playing all the games and interacting with the people and stuff. Yes. And then about and then about halfway through the carnival, a this fey woman calls her, them to the forest and says, uh, um, by the way, you know, ev uh, evil shit is happening, right? And mm -hmm. I need you to go stop it. And they go back to, like, they've been magically enchanted, so they no longer see the, the glamour. And they see that the, the whole fey cart, like, the fey have overtaken the carnival. And they're, they're not putting on games and stuff. They're just slaughtering everyone in yep, horrible, horrible like, ways. And it's sounds like, so like Tim and Nick. <laughs> it's it wonderful, see? It's That's fantastic. That's exactly what I want, right? I, love I it. want I want there to be a sense that... Um, that the whole world can be turned upside down and that there are powers beyond ordinary human experience. And, oh, by the way, you're heroes, so you get to deal with it. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, an ogre or a, a really big mean bear, uh, you're like, okay, that's, I guess, a heroic combat. But it's not the same as, um, you know, your whole city is being sold into the shadow realm and color is draining out of it and everything that your campaign has been about is just sliding into the shadow realm and i don't know do you feel like doing anything about that <laughs> what should you do no one knows you better find out which is I, so which is why i think uh, i think probably the best thing that paizo ever published is curse of the crimson throne was my favorite oh, yeah. adventure ever oh my god and they just did that beautiful new edition yeah um, with all the expanded art and mm -hmm. uh, write-ups and like cleaning it up a little and yeah, I mean, I don't care what rule set you're running, I would love to <laughs> play through that. I've uh, I I'm that's the, the group that I've been with for three years now. Uh, for about a year and a half of that, I've been running Curse of the Crimson Throne, and it's uh, it's a ton of fun. I love everything about it because I love yeah. urban adventure, and it's just got so many cool parts into in it. And I just get, you know, I, I've added so much to it. But, yeah, it's it's my favorite. If, you, if you're looking for something to pick up, I suggest that heavily. Uh, thank you so much, Lizelle129, for following. Welcome to the madness, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think that's probably going to be the last question we're going to take. We're going to have to wrap up here. But, uh, obviously, I want to give a big thank you to Wolfgang for hanging out and answering all our questions. Thank you so much, man. Oh, hey, it's been a blast. I love it here. I'm always glad to uh, talk shop and talk about games because, I don't know, it seems to be... Uh, <sighs> it's, it's a thing I love to do or I would have quit years ago, right? Yeah, it's it, you know what? That's one of the things is like... A long time ago when I needed content to put on the channel, like, what can I do? I can, I can sit in front of a camera and talk about gaming for a couple hours right yeah yeah you know, that's a topic good for a day or two or <laughs> a couple years or, or... <laughs> 55 episodes i don't know yeah uh... <laughs> hey that's awesome um no seriously thank you so much man i hope you had a good time i know i certainly had did a great time uh do you Thanks. want yeah do you want to go real quick and tell everyone a little bit about yourself where they can find you online and any sure thing. hooks and plugs you want to uh you want to drop Sure. I'll just say, um, yeah, you can find me uh, on Twitter. My personal account is at Monkey King, and the Cobalt Press account is at Cobalt Press. Um, we're on Facebook. The Cobalt Press webpage is coboldpress.com. Um, we're sort of on G, and a few other places. We have a Reddit 
somewhere that we poke at once in a while. But really, it's Twitter and Facebook and the Cobalt website, which is where we put free content. Three times a week, we put stuff up there. Uh, yesterday, I'll just plug this one. We put up a uh, fifth edition rules for the Kopesh Sword of Egypt, uh, some cool spells like Desiccating Breath, uh, Sand Ships for Caravans, and Alkadimi sort of adventures. Um, a whole bunch of just free Southlands, Alkadim, Arabian Night stuff. And we do this all the time. We put up freebies. We hold contests at Cobalt Press. Um, we're looking for new designers or new artists. Um, and if you really want to hear what we're up to next, like our next big Kickstarter, our next book of monsters, our next set of adventures, um, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the Cobalt Press webpage, there's a little square that says, yeah, I'd like to sign up for your newsletter once a month, which is where we announce our contests and give away our giveaways and do our deals and discounts. We, I guess we can't call it spam if we're only doing it once a month, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we try to keep the newsletter interesting and, and what do you know, people keep subscribing to it. So, um, uh, yeah, those are some of the places where I do stuff online. I also show up occasionally uh, on all these podcasts and forums and other places. But, yeah, I'm not hard to find. We have an open-door submission policy, as we discussed earlier, and that's uh, the Freelancer's Guidelines section of, a once again, CobaltPress.com. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to see some pitches and queries or um, art portfolios or map portfolios from some folks. Um we're always looking for new talent and, and pretty much having a good time with it. So, yeah, give me a shout. Absolutely. Thank you so much, man, and thank you for being here. Um, before you uh, – once again, all the links are in chat, so you guys can go check out uh, – Wolfgang on Twitter and also all the Cobalt Press stuff. As always, my name is Asker and I am your host and Dungeon Master here on Exploding Dice, uh, where we have live D and D every Saturday and Sunday. Well, one of them's not D and D, but we have live gaming every Saturday and Sunday, as well as creative streams like Askren's Map Monday, and then we have Fuzzy Dice every Tuesday here, where I bring in all kinds of game designers and nerd celebrities and podcasters and streamers, and we just have a good time and talk about gaming, because that is what we all love. Uh, obviously, if you haven't already, you can go follow me on Twitter. It's just at Askren. Dice Thulu has got the link there. And also, if you have, if you do follow us on Twitter and also on Twitch, which you should be doing, uh, you can hit that giveaway link, and you are already entered. All you have to do is just make sure you, uh, make sure you get, you click the button, and you can enter to uh, win our March giveaway, uh, which is a uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, a DM screen, some dice, and a Curse of Strahd book, all ready to go out for you at the end of the month. Um, I'm trying to think what else we have uh, coming up. There is nothing. Uh, there was yeah, we are going to be back with Jade Regent this Saturday, uh, this Sunday. We missed this past week because I was out with the Pax Plague, uh, the Pox, as it were. Uh, but we will be back to Writhing Moon with our new cast member, Lisa Lee, on Saturday and Jade Regent on Sunday. So you should definitely check those out. Um, that's really it. We are going to go find someone to, uh, to to pass the love on to, someone to raid, I think. Uh, so let me go check who's live right now. I think Nerd Immersion is live, so we're probably going to go – we're going to probably go say hi to them right now. That seems like a good idea. Um but, yeah, let me open that. Uh, but as as I'm doing that, I want you guys to uh, to remember, if you haven't already hit that follow button, please do. Uh, it's the best way to keep up with all of the all of the cool stuff that goes on here on the channel uh, is you have to follow. And if you really enjoy the content, you can go to gamewisp.com slash exploding dice. And you can, for just $5 a month, become one of Dice Thulu's minions. And you get all kinds of stuff. You get brand new emotes. We just made them uh, the other day, and more are coming. They're going to be sub-only emotes. You get a sub-badge. You get a Discord role. Uh, we also have a Discord. You can check it out right there. Um, and all that good stuff. So definitely consider supporting the channel if you enjoy the content. We're going to go raid Nerd Immersion. Uh, and so make sure you show the love to them. But as we get out of here, just remember, don't let Dice Thulu get his tentacles on you because he gets very handsy when he does. We'll see you next time, guys. Thank you for hanging out.
Goodbye.